Well, good afternoon. Well, we'll continue our study on the, oh, I guess the seal of the living God has been our topic from Sabbath school, and uh, we are talking about the parable of Christ. We're talking about the end of the world is the uh, end of probationary time, uh, which is the same. These are all synonymous terms, harvest, closer probation, end of probationary time. And, but we found that that's when God's going to have that final separation, right? That doesn't mean people aren't separating now, but that's when the final separation will take place. So we know that the tares and the wheat will grow together until that final separation. So, and if we have time, uh, we'd like to get to our scripture reading, which was our sermon for the 11 o'clock. But anyway, I think we'll continue with this study. Is that okay? Because we didn't quite finish that. So the last, where we had left off is that we asked the question, and what comes at the end of the work of the gospel? The work of the gospel, when the gospel is complete, is when there's that final separation. The work of the gospel is casting out the net, right? Trying to bring in, and there's going to be fish that will be good and fish that are bad. Casting out the net, but it's all separated at the end. And in the church, the tares and the wheat will grow together. Now, so we had talked about in 1844 that there really was a physical separation where God's people had come out of the other churches. And the last separation that we talked about was the year of 1888, where with, even within God's church, there was a, a spiritual separation, where there were those who embraced the message of righteousness by faith and those who didn't. And that's really ultimately where we are today. There's a clean separation in God's church today between those who believe in the message of righteousness by faith and those who don't. And those who believe in the message of righteousness by faith that we talked about would be represented by another parable we talked a little bit about, which was the ten virgins. They're the ones who believe in the message of righteousness by faith, but even amongst them, there will be a separation at the end. There will be the five foolish and, and the five wise. Okay? Make sense? So let me now continue on with this, uh, some statements here. In uh, early writings, page 50, she says, the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on. So even within God's church back in her day, there's already a shaking going on. And things that cause the shaking is whether people really embrace the truth and are growing. And there's going to be a natural shaking within the church if people don't continue to grow in those Christian, Christian virtues. But there's a mighty shaking that has commenced and will go on, and all that will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. So sometimes I think when we've taken that, that there will come a time when people are just going to be simply shaken out of the church. They just physically won't be there, and yet... At the same time, and this is why I did a sermon on this or a message, because it seems that Jesus is saying they're there till the harvest, and yet there's a, something about people being shaken out. But that's why I think we need to start thinking a little bit in terms that there's a separation, not just physically, but spiritually. There's, there's a separation. Let me just read another one. This is the second volume of Spiritual Gifts, page 284. And sometimes, because there's a spiritual separation, it does turn into a physical separation, doesn't it? And we, of course, have seen that. It says, just as long as God has a church, he will have those who will cry aloud and spare not, who will be his instruments to reprove selfishness and sin and will not shun to declare the whole counsel of God, whether men will hear or forbear. I saw that individuals would rise up against the plain testimonies. It does not suit their natural feelings. They would choose to have smooth things spoken to them. So we're talking about in the church, aren't we? And have peace cried in their ears. I view the church in a more dangerous condition than they ever have been. Experimental religion is known but by a few. The shaking must soon take place to purify the church. And so there is a shaking that's been going on, and there's a shaking that's going to continue for the purpose of purifying the church. And God will have a, a pure church. And sometimes when we've talked about the church, we've talked about the church militant, right? 
where there is a, and then what are the other phrases? A church militant and a church triumph. It seems like there's another phrase in there I'm forgetting. But, um, but there is the church as a whole. But there is a triumphant church too. Um, you know, in the parable of the virgins, clearly they're attending the same meetings. Five are foolish and five wise. Well, let's continue some of our statements here. Um, I asked, oh, this is from Early Writings 270. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had been seen, or I had seen and was shown, that it would be caused by the straight testimony which called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This would have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not hear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking amongst God's people. I saw the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and will be purified. So the reason for this statement, I want to quote it, was that there are people who've already risen up against it, who continue to rise against the straight testimony, but they're still where? They're actually still in the church. It's not like they've been physically shaken out of the church that they don't attend the church anymore. But within the church, you have a shaking going on where... I mean, if there, there's places you could go and preach a straight testimony and people really don't want to hear it, right? Uh, there, are, there are pastors, and I'll, I'll give you an example of some. Uh, this was a, an elder that shared this with me not long ago. A church in uh, North Dakota, I believe he said it was, where the pastor who came in to pastor said he didn't want anybody quoting the spirit of prophecy at church. And people did. People continue to do that. And it became a real battle in this church. You know what they wound up doing? They shut down the church. You imagine that? They shut down the church. And then some of the members try to get it going again. Now that sounds like what I just read here. That there, there's going to be people who are going to stand up against the straight testimony, against the true witness to the latest scenes, to the point they'd even be willing to shut down a church. That's pretty drastic. But there are controls like that where people feel a little handcuffed to be able to share certain things. Okay? I think that I don't, as far as I heard from him, I don't know that they, I think people try to get the church going again, whether it's going today or not, I don't know. So. Yeah, they could be. In First Testimonies, page 187, God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to a different, to different points calculated to manifest what's in the heart. Some endure at one point, but fall off at the next. At every advanced point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer because God's trying to what? He's trying to bring us to perfection, right? If the professed people of God find their hearts opposed to this straight work, it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome if they would not be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. And this is why the true witness, the Bible and spirit prophecy are so important to present to the church so that we can be tested. We still see where we're short, right? But if people oppose the straight testimony, well, people aren't even hearing it. But anyway, we'll move on. This, it continues and says, um, said the angel, God will bring his work closer and closer to test and prove every one of his people. Some are willing to receive one point, but when God brings them to another testing point, they shrink from it and stand back because they find that strikes directly at some cherished idol. Here they have opportunity to see what is in their hearts that shuts out Jesus. They prize something higher than the truth, and their hearts are not prepared to receive Jesus. Individuals are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idols and heed the counsel of the true witness. If any will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride, and evil passions, the angels of God will have the charge. They are joined to their idols. Let them alone. And they pass on to their work, leaving these with their sinful traits unsubdued 
to the control of evil angels. Wow, what a statement. Those who have come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. Uh, First Testimonies 187. So the early rain has to include God bringing us all these tests. And we need to be listening to the counsel of the true witness, the Bible, spirit of prophecy. And when God brings us to a point and we, by his grace, succeed and take another step, we're getting closer to receiving what? The latter rain. But what if as a church we hear the straight testimony and we oppose it? We're not even close to being ready for the latter rain, right? Which is exactly why we're still here. So the church actually does need to hear the whole counsel of God, which is exactly why you exist. Isn't that right? You exist for that very purpose. And I, and I feel so, so for our churches that don't get that. Yes. Of none effect. That's right. So where are we at today? There are, there's a lot of opposition, um, and we oppose it by simply not using it. But there is literal opposition at the same time. But what's going to prepare us for the latter rain is to allow God to bring us to every point, and, and, he's going to, and he brings us these things to show us what's in our heart. If he didn't bring us in these situations, we really wouldn't see ourselves as we really are. But he's trying to prepare us to bring us to that maturity through and to receive the latter rain. So this the statement, this next statement is in uh, uh, letter 11, 1890. It's also found in the seventh volume of the Bible commentary, 976. And it's going to talk about the sealing work. Because we've talked about, you know, there's a seal of God, but there's a seal of the living God. We've talked about when the separation takes place. And God's people are going to receive the seal of the living God right at the end. And the angel ascends to heaven and says it's done, right? When the work of the gospel is done. Okay? Listen to the statement. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, which would be uniting church and state and passing a Sunday law, right? For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. So before your eternal destiny is decided, you've got to go through this test. And then she quotes Revelation 11, chapter 13, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. And then we had read this part is what she says after that quote. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Now, nobody's received the mark of the beast yet, right? Because the test hasn't come yet. So ultimately, no one's really ultimately received the seal of the... at the same time, because we haven't been brought to that test either, but you still could be sealed of the Holy Spirit now. There's a difference. Let me talk about that in a little bit here. Okay? Um... Look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. That there are two seals. Paul wrote that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted that after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? So this isn't a sealing like the Baptists think, once sealed, always sealed, or once saved, always saved. There's still a sealing of the Holy Spirit. But Paul's not talking about a future seal. He's talking about a seal of the Holy Spirit people have already received. Isn't that right? Isn't that what I just read? Uh, nobody in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 had gone through the final test. Okay? So this is a seal of the Spirit 2,000 years before the final test. Now look at uh, 
Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 1 and 4. And the fifth angel sounded. The fifth angel. Is that a past or present? It would be past. The fifth angel sounded. The fifth trumpet. It would be past. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, only those men which have not the what? Seal of God in their foreheads. So there's a seal of God that God's people have always received, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, when they receive Christ, because their minds have now been renewed and changed. And they have it on their foreheads because they have a renewed mind. They've been born again. But that's not the same as a seal of the living God just before the close of probation. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, yeah. I mean, a seal that every Christian has, that you belong to God, okay? Which has to be associated with the Holy Spirit because that's what Jesus talked about. He said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You have to be born of the, the Spirit, okay? So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but it's not speaking in tongues. It's not once saved, always saved. It's just the sealing of the Holy Spirit that you have now given your life to God, okay? And he's going to hold you. You're the only one ultimately, that breaks that relationship, right? And there's a statement, I don't know if I have it here, but we are like his fortress, and that's an important phrase. It's his fortress that he holds against the devil. And it doesn't matter if there's a 10 billion man army outside the walls. God is able to defeat all the enemies outside the wall. Where's the enemy? Inside. It only takes one in enemy inside that fortress to open the door. Okay? So when we talk about being sealed, when we come to Christ and he becomes, we're his fortress, he's trying to seal out evil and seal in righteousness. Yeah, this would be the early reign experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, two reigns, two sealing of the Holy Spirit but one in the very ends for a specific purpose, after God's people have been tested, okay? And I would say that it's going to be very similar to Noah when the ark was sealed and then the flood came. Because when you look at Revelation 6 and the world's going to fall apart, who's able to stand? And the answer is, when the whole world's falling apart and every island and mountain is being moved, the only ones that are going to be able to stand like that, like a flood, is those who receive the seal of the living God. Okay? Anyway, we're going to get to that. Okay? But I just wanted to notice that the Bible talks about two seals. And in, in Sons and Daughters of God, she says, The law of God, which is perfect holiness, is the only true standard of character. Love is expressed in obedience, and perfect love casts out all fear. Those who love God have the seal of God in their foreheads and work the works of God. That is Sons and Daughters of God, page 51. But that statement is saying that people, while she's even writing this and preceded, before she wrote this, could have what? They could have the seal of God because they're doing what? They're keeping the commandments of God. Right? I'll read it again. The law of God, which is perfect holiness, is the only true standard of character, Love is expressed in obedience, and perfect love casts out all fear. Those who love God, and that sounds like present, those who love God have currently, present tense, the seal of God in their foreheads and work the works of God. And this is before the great test. So you can have the seal of God, not the seal of the living God, which is given at that time. So there's two different kinds of seals here. Okay. Now, having that, I want to read you this statement. This is in the fourth volume of the Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 1161. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, 
It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has already begun. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. So the reason to talk about the shaking, which she says has already come, and to have a people who are receiving the seal of God, which is the same as a settling into the truth, right, is a work that must have already been going on before people receive the seal of the living God. And so in, in a lot of circles I've been in, conservative circles, it seems like they equate the settling of the truth as some more end time thing to receive the seal of the living God. And, 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 and I'm, what I'm going to argue is that we looked at statements about a shaking which has already started in her time. And that language is being used in this text about a settling into the truth which means that all along, God's people have needed to be settling into the truth under the early rain, preparatory of receiving the latter rain. So the settling in the truth to me, is, I, it seems like I've always heard it just associated with the latter rain. It's like, well, no. It's really an early rain experience preparing you to continue the settling into the truth so as that you could never be moved. And this is why there's a test here and there's a test here. So you're settling and you're settling and you're settling. And there's a point where you can't simply be moved. The final touch, right? But it's a settling of the truth that begins when you first become a Christian. You first become a Christian and you're beginning to start what? Settling into the truth. And he brings you point by point and you settle more. The more you learn, the more you settle, the more that you're going to do for God. But there's still what? The teacher of righteousness is the early rain. The Holy Spirit is teaching you about righteousness, God's righteous teaching, so you can keep what? Settling. To the point where you could never, you're just not going to be moved. And maturing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think the emphasis I'm trying to say here is that it just seems like even in Adventist circles, so much is thrown into, well, that's going to be a future. We're going to experience that in the future. It's like, well, you know, friends, we're never going to get to the future until we actually are more serious about what's supposed to happen under the early reign. <clears throat> so you might say the first seal prepares us for the second. It's just like there's the first angel's message, then a, you know, one, you know, you have that progression, right? Okay. Is it true that the seal of God is a sign of ownership? But how do we belong to God? Okay, and we just kind of already mentioned it. Righteousness is sealed in and sin is sealed out. And if we start thinking about the seal of God in that sense, beginning under the under early reign, right? God is constantly leading us to seal sin out of our lives as we continue to learn. And at the same time, sealing righteousness in. And you keep growing and you keep settling to a point where... Whew, God finally has a people who are ready for the latter rain, for that, just that finishing touch. And then he's got a people ready for harvest. In Desire of Ages, page 311, God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. Wow. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This command is a promise. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil and has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. And that's why the early reign, the teaching to 
seal out that sin. God's trying to seal out the sin out of our lives. Okay? Um, is there, can you think of something that, and of course, sealing sin out and sealing righteous sin is a demonstration of the, the power of God in our life, right? Can't do it by ourselves. What do we have that's a memorial to God's power? Yeah. And so when you, when you start thinking about it, then you start thinking, well, now I'm wondering, is the seal of the living God going to be associated with the Sabbath? Because ultimately, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, the early rain, the latter rain, right? It's all about the power of the Holy Spirit to seal righteousness in and seal sin out. It's all about God's power, but it's always our choice. But it's his power, and one of the greatest outward displays of us believing in the power of God is going to be the Sabbath, right? And Sunday, a man-made institution is really that people are trying to live without what? With God, the power of God. And that's why, in one way, it's, it's, they are in opposition to each other, theologically, clearly. And ultimately, that's the real meaning and we're going to see some statements that the seal of the living God is directly applied to the Sabbath. And we'll see some statements here. Um, so, the work of the gospel is the sealing work of the Holy Spirit. The former reign is the work of the Holy Spirit. The latter reign is the work of the Holy Spirit. The former reign, begin, former reign begins the work. The latter reign brings it to perfection. And then again in 4th volume of the Testimonies 1161, just as soon as the people of God are settled in their, sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. So they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it's already begun. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. So God's people have been settling in their truth since the time of Sister White to bring us to a point where there is, of course, the latter rain and the finishing of the work. Um, so we already have the seal of God now, but we read some statements earlier that after God's people had gone through the test, this is the test that God's people must have before they're sealed. And you say, well, the mark of the beast, the Sunday laws, the persecution, I can't be sealed until then, but I thought I was already sealed. And that's why, obviously, there's two seals, right? The seal of the Holy Spirit, but then the seal of the living God is, I receive after I've had the test. Okay? So, um, Let me read you a statement now from um, Early Writings, page 58. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with worldly thoughts and cares. I saw that some minds are led away from present truth and a love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books. Others are filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat, drink, and wear, all of which is keeping us from what? Settling into the truth, right? Some are looking too far off for the coming of the Lord. Time has continued a few years longer than we expected. Therefore, they think it may continue a few years more. And in this way, their minds are being led from present truth out after the world. In these things, I saw great danger. For if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out. And there's no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. Isn't that interesting, David? So here we are in the end of time, and we've got to make sure that we keep our focus. Our mind has to be focused on all the right kinds of things 
so that we're not distracted to start getting into the world. Because if we start thinking that way, we're not going to be thinking about present truth, which is going to be preparatory for God placing the seal of the living God on our foreheads. Okay? She says, I saw that the time for Jesus is to be to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and that time can last but a little longer. What leisure time we have should be spent, spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. She goes on and says, My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually, and let them crowd out worldly thoughts and cares. While you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act wholly in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time while the four angels are holding the four winds to make our calling an election short. And it's just to say, I mean, I, mean, I look at this and I look at what's happening politically. I just look at what just happened over in Israel with Trump trying to annex, what was it, the West Bank or Golan Heights. And, and of course, the reason is because the dominionists believe what? Yeah, that it's all originally Israel's land from offered or promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But who's Israel? It's the church. So you have foreign policy based on erroneous concepts of prophecy. Not just Jerusalem become the capital, but it's the annexation of the West Bank, Golan Heights, which just destroys the two-state solution. There will not be an Israel and a Palestinian state side by side. Just Israel. This is foreign policy today, based on erroneous concepts of prophecy. And I look at that and I say, you know, so somebody says these people are working in darkness. You know, they know they want to pass a Sunday law. They know that today they want to pass a Sunday law. They're not telling us that because that could hurt re-election. I'm telling you, friends, if, you, if you've got a second term here and, and the Dominionists have the one guy who's done everything they want, whether Supreme Court justice, which Reagan and Bush never did for them, that's why they went to an outsider. That's why Jeb Bush and all these guys had no chance because the previous guys didn't quite give them what they wanted. Because what they believe, another temple, one state solution, it's just Israel, take over all the land, literal battle, military battle of Armageddon. They believe this stuff. They've got somebody who's doing everything they want. Okay? And they get it. So I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but if I was going to say, in the next year and a half, we're going to have another election. You realize it's just a year and a half away. Do I think, I could be completely wrong, I don't think they're going to push for a Sunday law in the next year and a half. They're pushing to be reelected. They're going to focus on the border. Okay? But if they have four more years, what do you think they're going to push for? You bet they are. From a, from a, human standpoint, because God could hold back the four winds and you can't calculate that. How do you calculate God holding back the four winds? Is that two years, four years, ten years? I have no idea. Yeah, he's been holding it back. But what if he doesn't hold it back any longer because the number is made up? What if there's enough people who've been settling into the truth? Right? Who've been advancing and that's the key. That's always been the key. It's never been about the world being wicked enough. Even though there has to be a harvest there too. They have to come. Is the world ready for harvest? Has the world come to maturity and evil? Absolutely. I mean, what people watch, all the gaming that goes on, all the murder and all the immorality and all the gaming stuff. I mean, this is what most kids watch. It's amazing. Gay marriage, all these, I mean, this is, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. It is mature. But what's going to make it mature is when religious 
people want to murder other people because they worship on the wrong day. That's when it fills its cup. That's when you get to a point where, no, nope, that's maturity. That is absolute wickedness. You thought gay marriage was bad? Man, you start murdering people because they worship on a different day. That's real bad. That's, to me, that's worse. And so, but how far are you away from that? I'm telling you, friends, just from a human perspective, and it's always been this way, God holding back the four winds, but if he doesn't, all the stars line up, friends. You've got the Supreme Court to pass it, right? You've got someone who wants to be, you know, King David, you know? I'm telling you, I mean, we're here. And so when I, when I start reading some of these statements and it says, uh, oh, no, where I think I just read it. I, I just lost it. But anyway, but it was about being ready. Oh, I, it was the mindset that we really do believe Jesus is coming soon. And it's got to affect the decisions we make. Jesus is coming soon. We can't say the day or the hour. We have no idea. But humanly speaking, I don't even see that it's possible that it wouldn't be in a second term with Donald Trump. I don't see how that's even possible, except God holding back the four winds. But anyway, I want to read you this one on Desire of Ages 324. Because we've been talking about sealing sin out, and, and it's a, I alluded to the, his own fortress. It says, when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. That sounds very radical. I mean, good radical, right? When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, which is all we can do, we can't earn salvation, we can't make ourselves holy. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. Wow. A change is wrought, which man can never accomplish for himself which is exactly why our church wasn't ready in 1888. These men tried to make themselves righteous. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature, which is exactly what Jones and Wagner were preaching. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, Christ's own fortress, which he, Jesus, holds in a revolted world, Man, that's the only way to live in this world. you got to be a fortress, Jesus' fortress, in a revolted world. You can't be your own fortress. And he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. The soul thus kept and possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. And that, my friends, is a settling into the truth with the right premise, meaning you and I can do nothing of ourselves. And you've got to start off understanding righteous by faith on the right step. It's not you doing, it's you and I surrendering. And when we surrender all, and he takes possession, and it's a new heart, a new power, it's his own fortress, there's not a thing the devil can do to knock it down. Unless you let them. It says here in Great Controversy 623, Now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptation asserts its power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, John 14, 30. Satan could find nothing in the Son of Man that would enable him to gain the victory. He kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Are you tempted on the outside? Absolutely, there's a thousand things out there Satan's trying but as long as there's no corresponding cord in here, you don't let them in. Don't open the door. What was that, called a Trojan horse when they had the soldiers inside that thing? 
You see, they could fight them all out all day long outside the walls, keeping them from coming in. Is when they let them inside. Think of a fortress against whom the enemy has come to conquer. But the walls are high and thick, the moat is wide and deep, and the enemy cannot knock down those walls. The enemy without cannot come in, just the one inside. Now, I want to read something here. Um, Peter. Peter fell because there was something inside of him. He didn't know it was inside of him, right? But once Peter realized of his self-sufficiency, and that was it, he had a, a self-sufficiency inside of him, which is what opened the door for him to be tempted to deny the Lord three times, right? But if that enemy is dead, right? It's not able to open the door, he doesn't fall. Sister White said in Christ's Object Lesson 154, now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. So did God know that was in Peter? Did he allow a situation to happen so he could see his own faults? Okay, God's going to do that for us. You'll be put into a situation, not that you have to fall, but you see where there's still an enemy inside. There's still something to overcome. And if we fall, we what? We repent. We get back right God with God, but we're that much what? We're that much wiser because now we know. We know the enemy now. And Peter didn't fall again in this area. Isn't that amazing? That was an enemy inside of him that he didn't know that God allowed the circumstances to happen for him to see it, and he never fell again in that area. A beautiful example. Um... So let's, uh, I probably just have a little time, right? So why don't we just talk about um, the seal of the living God. We'll just conclude with that. So there is a seal of the Holy Spirit that we all have as Christians. People in the past had the seal of the Holy Ghost. But only those who endure the test in the end, as described by Revelation 13, receive the seal of the living God. So let me read you a few statements here. Uh, The first time Ellen White associated the seal with the Sabbath was in 1848. A few months later, in January of 1849, Joseph Bates, the pioneer Sabbath theologian, uh, published the first Adventist book on the subject and called it a seal of the living God, pointing to the Sabbath. Um, Let's see here. In Great Controversy, page 452, it says the seal, of, the seal of God, the seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. Uh, Signs of the Times, March 22nd, 1910. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. It points to God as the creator and is the sign of his rightful authority over the beings he has made. Uh, Signs of the Times, March 22nd, 1910. So when I, so when many Christians, especially after Sunday had become the day, changed by the church, many, of course, were brought up. They could become a Christian, just didn't know Sabbath was the day. Doesn't mean they couldn't become Christians. I, I became a Christian, well, didn't, didn't, didn't come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church right away. And so, uh, and you think of how many people have come out of the other churches to join this church. And so, uh, you can be sealed of God, and you just, you keep searching, you keep moving forward, and God's showing you. But we're going to be in a situation in the world where people will have to make a choice clearly for or against God as who has authority over them. And when everybody has that clear presentation, they have enough light to know what the issue is. And it's like, well, if I take the mark of the beast, I can buy and sell. 
if I take this, keep the Sabbath, I face the wrath of man. But by taking the mark of the beast, they face the wrath of God. And what are most people going to choose? Yeah, they're going to choose to take the mark of the beast and hope against hope they're not going to experience the wrath of God. That all these false miracles and all these things is proof that God's actually on that side. But they will have enough light to know that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God and that we belong to him, yes. Counting on God's mercy? Oh, sure, I think they are going to want... But see, this is where early rain, latter rain is the gospel. Because when people say, well, I think God's just going to be merciful to me, even though I knowingly are... What do they just simply believe in? It? They're just believing not even, hardly even in an early rain, let alone a latter rain. So if, if really people... And this would really be a good booklet, wouldn't it? For Christians, early rain, latter rain. And just tie it right into the gospel. And say, where are we today? Where are you as an individual today? In your Christian growth. Settling into the truth. It'd be a really, I mean, it's a really important book. Because it's a concept. It's a concept, but for most Christians, it's just about everything ended at the, at the cross. And that affects how you think about where you've got to be as a Christian. And if it's just mercy, 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 that's what God would say in the Old Testament. He says, I don't want all your sacrifices. I want what? I want your heart. I want your obedience. It's the same gospel today. It's the same gospel. In Review and Herald, July 13, 1897, but the seal of the living God is placed upon those who conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. You know, that's pretty clear statements, isn't it? Because you've got to go through the test. You've got to go through the test, and if you remain faithful to the test, and the test is going to be over the, over the Sabbath, which is ultimately obedience to God and all his commandments, of which this is one of ten. And that's why it's associated with that. Great Controversy, page 640. Too late they see that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. Review and Herald, May 21st, 1895. This li- the seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. Well, that's a little different definition, but it means the same thing. Because Christ would have always obeyed his father even if he faced what? Death, just like the three Hebrew worthies. There's, there's no difference there, right? That when you and I are living in the end of time and we're choosing to obey God, whatever the issue, we are reflecting the image of Christ which shows that we have a likeness to Christ. So by receiving the seal of the living God, it is a likeness to Christ doing exactly what he's doing, which is exactly why I think in Revelation 14, 12, the description of God's people is those who can keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's the same thing because you can never keep them without the faith of Jesus. You've got to keep them for the same way, with the same motive, by the same power as Jesus did by faith. It's got to be all that, right? <clears throat> so look, in reading Revelation 6, verses 17, verse 17, and Revelation 7, chapter 7, verse 2. I mean, listen to this. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who's able to stand? And this is after it describes every island being moved and so forth. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice of the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the sea, the earth and the sea. I mean, what's happening here? Yeah, I mean, the work of the latter rain has been going out. The seal's now being placed on God's people. They've been holding back the four winds. Now the work of the gospel is complete. They let those four winds go, and what's going to start happening? Seven last plagues. Ursk is going to be an absolute desolation. So let me partly ask you this question. And I don't think I have a statement for it. But if we have to go through this test, people who already have the seal of the Holy Spirit, 
They go through a test before they can receive the seal of the living God, having been tested over the Sabbath. The seal is a sense of ownership that they, through this great test and this great trial, they demonstrated that they belong to, uh, without a doubt. I mean, how could you get any greater evidence that you have chosen God in a world that's completely keeping the first day, penalizing those who keep the seventh day, and you still stick with God? And you've lost every earthly support. And you have been settling into the truth with the early reigns since you became a Christian. Settling, settling. And you get to the point and you, kill, you keep taking your stand. You can't be moved on this issue. You're going to maintain your fidelity to God under penalty of death. And you do that and you receive the seal of the living God. And then once you receive the seal of the living God, what happens? Then the angels don't hold back. And everything just blows up, starts falling apart. And so that's why, in my own thought there, that the seal of the living God, to me, is much like Noah. For 120 years, he preached that it was going to rain when it, it never rained. And people didn't believe it, they didn't believe it, they didn't believe it, but he believed it. He believed it so much that he publicly demonstrated he believed it by building what? An ark. He believed it that much. He he was at work. He worked. And people didn't believe. You imagine the ridicule this man would have heard? Absolute ridicule. People laughing at him. He would have been the butt of every joke. And so he gets in the ark. It's time to get in. The door is shut. It's what? It's sealed. Nobody comes out. Nobody goes in. And nothing's time for seven days, which should remind us of what? The Sabbath. <laughs> Seven-day cycle. Okay? And so, the seal of the living God, I think, is going to be very similar to that. Because... When you receive the seal of the living God and you're part of the 144,000, you're going through the the time of the seven last plagues, you're not the recipient of them. But you're you're there. You're not going to receive the boils like in the first plague, but you've got people all around you. The waters turn blood, the darkness, the heat. You're indirectly affected by all this, right? But you're not the recipient of it. To me, that'd be kind of like being on a boat that's going like this and there's nothing but water out there. It, was the, it didn't kill you, but you're indirectly affected by it. But you're sealed. You're, Noah is safe from the flood. And God's people are sealed with the seal of little God. They will not be the recipients of these plagues and they will live through them. And the wicked will die. It's a very similar parallel, isn't it? Um, oh, here, this is why, early writings, page 71. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. So there really was, there is a connection. There is something right there in the spirit of prophecy. Um, here's another one, early writings, page 43, Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the ceiling was passed. Wow, that's just terrible. I mean, he sees the ceiling going on. He's going to try to get you to do everything. You're not sealed. But anyway, Satan was trying to his every art to hold them where they were until the ceiling was passed, until the covering was drawn over God's people, and they left, and they left without a shelter from the burning wrath of God in the seven last plagues. So there really is a connection between the seal of the living God, which is a sign of ownership. That's first and foremost. But because you're owned by God, and you prove that through the great test, this seal is going to protect you from the seven last plagues. Does that make sense? Last quote, early writings, 48. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, then they who are holy and righteous will be holy and righteous still, For all their sins will be blotted out, and they will be sealed with the seal of the living God. So so the seal of the living God is going to happen right towards the end, isn't it?
But in the meantime, settling, 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 settling. <laughs> yeah, and keeping our focus. That's how we set it. You know, because if we don't keep our focus, it, he diverts our attention so that the sealing time is passed and we're not protected. Our Father in heaven, we think about the shortness of time and we are so thankful that you've kept us till now. And because of that, we know that you'll keep us till the end. Hold us, Father, as your own fortress against the evils of this world. And show us, Father, what yet enemies lie within, that we may completely and fully settle into the truth. For as a people you've been waiting for for so long, that will settle into the truth fully, reflecting that altogether beautiful image of Jesus. So thank you, Father, that through the word and the spirit of prophecy you have shown us the events that will transpire on the earth and where we need to be as a people. Forgive us, Father, we've fallen short. And we thank you for your almighty power, your ever-presence to guide us. In this we pray in Jesus' name.